Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone. Welcome, everyone, One to our last night early career seminar. And I'm Xiangming Sun, and I'm a, a member of our last night early career network. Today, I have I have great honor to have a, have Dr. Waters as our speaker today. He is the author of the the Red Crop, which is a very famous, powerful, beautiful, popular package in our class community. And we also have have Tarek as our TA. So uh, our our seminar today has three parts. One is a, a very brief introduction about this uh, this package, and then we have a Q and A session, and then we have about uh, the hands-on training, which uh, might be about uh, one one hour, and then we also will upload this uh, this video to the to the YouTube channel, and uh, then uh, you can you can follow us on the on the Twitter, and uh, and you can uh, you can join us uh, on the on the email list. So now I will I will ask Jack to have a brief introduction about our our speaker today. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Wutzler. Um, so he's a researcher uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Jena, Germany. Um, his main focus is on uh, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling in soils, but he also uh, has a focus on uh, research software engineering, um, which is related to his background as a trained software engineer. Um, he's, he's worked in the already proc uh, as well as other uh, technical um, packages uh, in R and other languages. Um, and also worked uh, with eddy covariance data, such as his past work with the Tarant uh, long term eddy covariance system. Uh, so we're really happy to have Thomas here, and I will turn it over to him. Thanks, Jake, for this introduction. So I will share my screen and start presenting the first part. So if you have questions in between, please feel free to um, interrupt me or to write in the chat and so on. I will from time to time have a look. So our today's session is on processing half-hourly eddy data with the R eddy proc package. Just a brief note. Yeah. Wow, okay. Um, if you want to um, see the slides also on your computer, not only here, and I have a GitHub repository with all the cores, and also the link is in the email that you got where you have the hands on session in a different directory for standard processing. There are all the slides. Now, our ID proc purpose is to support you with um, so called post processing of carbon fluxes. So there is a lot of standard tools already for processing the, the very short time Hertz data, but usually you also want to post process your um, net ecosystem exchange fluxes that you get already on half hourly. So there are three steps that are commonly done. The one is the estimation of the so-called star threshold, which we will go into detail later. Then is gap filling your data to replace missing data by model data. And then also partitioning the fluxes and the cross fluxes of respiration and cross primary production. These are the three main things that our ID proc can help you. And there is one actor in the uh, our ID proc package, it's called the R ID proc class. So the software has been designed with an object oriented uh, mind. 
because we have a lot of data and in the times when we started work on this package, it was much more efficient to not having too much copies of the data, but um, just um, edit the data in place. That's why we decided on the R6 object oriented class pattern, uh, which is not often used in the R community. And yeah. So typical R users may have got some time to get around to get used to this kind of file in R. But actually, you uh, initiate um, your class once, and then you interact with the class by feeding your data into this class, tell all your ancillary information like time zone and the geolocation of your site, and doing some parameters if you don't uh, accept the standard parameters. And then you ask the class to compute interesting stuff for you, like partition fluxes or computing uncertainty estimates. So a typical day of this R proc class, yeah, I call this EPROC, and you can, it's just a variable, you can name it, is that it's first initialized. Can you see my mouse? I hope so. Otherwise, yes. Two. You can see it, Thomas. Okay. Yeah, there is this S proc new, where you initialize this class and usually you give your data set the data frame with all your data and for later on for the flux partitioning you also tell where your site is located by latitude and you also give the time zone and then you um, say eproc dollar and then you invoke a so-called method on this block this is a function but this function has not only access to all the three uh, all the arguments that you provide to it but also to all the fields and the data that is stored in the edit block class. So usually you do this in, in the three steps. You estimate the response threshold and its distribution. And if the edit block knows this threshold, it can filter the data for unsuitable conditions. You, fit, uh, you get fill all those unsuitable conditions and missing values. And at the end, you say to flux partition. At the very end, you may say, um, give me the results of a typical usual R data frame or store to a file. All the annotations. There is a problem in the usual start processing chain as, as a single chain. And the main problem is that the edit covariance method is not applicable at quite stable conditions. So it needs turbulence. But at what level this turbulence is sufficient is not really clear. So there are some quality checks already in, in the data processing before you get the half hourly data, are they usually not sufficient? And one of the methods um, to detect those periods where the edit data is technically correct but not representative for your footprint is you um, plot your edit data against so called U star, that is the friction velocity, a micrometeorological property of how strongly the wind speed is increasing and um, the wind profile is increasing with the height. And this is kind of a dimensionally parameter, and if it's a low, Friction velocity, you have also low turbulence. And if you have otherwise similar environmental conditions, then uh, your respiration at night or in the nighttime should not depend on any other things. It should be equal. So it should be at a stable level, not depending on the response threshold. And when you see it's leveling up, it's going towards um, more closely to zero values, then you know it's wrong. But um, if you decide for this line here as the response threshold, you could also decide it could be here or maybe even, even here. This has large consequences in the subsequent processing. So after capturing, if you exclude more data that is biased flow, you get higher in the value. So the bias propagates, of course, also to the um, cross fluxes. And then it's a question what threshold should I choose? And the R edit proc class 
um, provides you uh, a way to process or to repeat all the protein with many of those C star thresholds. And you should invoke this by R proc and your know, E proc dollar. And then what thing you want to do, followed by a um, method or function name you star things. And this one repeats the usual processing step like gap filling um, and produces several output columns. So the usual output column any E has no new star filtering applied. Then underscore the star is the star threshold estimated from the original data. And then you have un um, underscore U and the number between zero and you know, 100, 199. And this is the quantile of the distribution of these star thresholds that are estimated by bootstrapping your data. And if you have those many columns, then, um, for example, on the multiplication exchange, you can compute the mean or the standard deviation, or after some fiddling around with the data and extracting, you can also plot the distribution or histogram or whatever. In how it changes with your quantile. So in summary, how the um, processing works, you import your half hour data, which is usually the NAE and some meteor data, and you estimate the distribution of the three star threshold. And depending on the threshold, you filter out the data. And the larger the threshold, the more data is filtered. And repeat all the processing steps like filling the gaps, partitioning the fluxes, and then you get a lot of output columns. And then you need to decide which of them you use, or you can use the average or some aggregate value and export the result. And this slide quite nicely summar summarizes all these steps. Questions so far? I see none in the chat. Then I go on over the first step, which is the gap filling. And the mouse again here. So I already introduced you to this um, new star threshold, and if you don't apply it, that you get by um, biased and e values. So Actually, I don't want to get them. I want to use false threshold estimation. So uh, these examples have been produced with some, some R session in the background and all the plots that you see that are really produced in this R markdown document. And we will look at such a document later on. Usually you load the R editor library in R and then you load your um, data that you want to process, this half hourly data, which R editor usually assumes is in tab separated format. Text form and has one line of, of units of it. And you get some feedback with all the units and the columns that have been loaded. And then you initialize, okay, you initialize the edit prop class. So this S edit prop new. You give it a name, you give it the data, and you give the columns that you want to provide to the edit prop class, which are usually the net ecosystem exchange. Incoming solar radiation, air temperature, also the soil temperature, vapor pressure deficit, and the use star friction velocity. But um, our edit prop um, wants to have an R timestamp. So you need to convert text of the year, day of the year, and hour to this edit prop POSIX timestamp, which is a function that's called convert time to POSIX. That's a step before. You might also estimate the VPD from temperature and um, relative humidity. There's also function provided by the package. 
and you can set them the location right away. So we can now eProc dollar. So you invoke a method on this class and tell this class now where your site is located. If you want to get the help displayed, the simplest way is to do question mark R any proc inside your R console. And if you want to display uh, the help for a specific function, do question mark in the function name. However, when you want to display the help of the method of the edit block class, the question mark is edit block underscore and then the method name. So um, this thing now is as to make the star scenarios and is about estimating this threshold. So we've seen this picture already. We want to have a threshold in the star, and whenever we have a record, the time when the star is below this threshold, and we set the NUE to an A and say we want to fill this because it's not representative. And we want to not only have one estimate, but we want to estimate an entire distribution. So we have some quantiles that we want to have here. Here in the example, it's, it's a low number of um, samples that we draw usually with the number of 2000 or so on. And then you give the probabilities. And for a good uncertainty, you specify more of these probabilities, not only the five, 95, percentile, but maybe the 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And here for the sake of processing time and displaying the number of results, I just picked three of them. And then you can say eProc get estimated your small special distribution. And what you get is for each season, this is a sub part of the year. We get the value uh, estimated on the original data set and the quantiles that we specified. And threshold distribution changes across the year because also the roughness of the surface will be changed. So when you harvest a crop field or a wheat field, then the wind profile will look different because you have a much more smooth surface and also a deeper surface than before the harvest. And in the default setup, you have four periods around the year. So that you roughly get the vegetation period, the non-vegetation period, growing period, and so on. And then you also aggregate all these different two star thresholds to one uh, value across the year, which is the maximum across all the different regions. And you can, again, also aggregate across all the years and get a single maximum to be star threshold By default, only the yearly estimates are used. So each year has a different distribution in the processing. Oops. Um, here the it should picture <laughs> similar to the end slide of the previous thing where we have different different gaps in the low medium and high use star threshold uh, picture I'm going here. So here you would see more gaps of course you identified more identified more records that have to be removed. Um, sometimes it reduces the coverage of your data of more than 60% missing if you have a high use star threshold. So there is really a lot of effect on gap filling in the processing here. Sometimes you want um, not only the, the annuals use star thresholds, but the seasonal use star thresholds, and you can tell as you drop. Um, just to expect the default the star thresholds or to tell our edit drop to use seasonal use star thresholds. And if you can set ask our edit drop which use star thresholds you can use in gap filling, you get different results. I right? flip forward and backward. These are the annual use star thresholds. They are all the same for each of the seasons. And 
this is the seasonal star thresholds and there are different between different seasons across the year. And you would use the seasonal star thresholds when you really know you have the crop where harvest changes your um, velocity, wind velocity profile. And if you don't have this much information on your side, you would use the annual the star threshold scenario because it's a bit more conservative. So we do this the maximum threshold and introduce more depth. But if you have all the information, you can say, okay, I have my season starts. They start in day 70, 210, and 320 in the year 1998. And then I can create those season factors by providing this data frame. And then it would um, create seasons that really start at this day and end at the given day of the year. So if you know the harvest times, you can really specify which are the seasons that you want to have different response threshold. Now, by the way, the default starts in December. So it crosses the year boundary, um, January, February, for winter season, that means spring season, summer season, and autumn season. So much for the new star special estimation. Do you have questions? Let me see. Yes, the pictures are unfortunately not displayed. That's um error on my side. <laughs> Two winters, right? So we have two winter seasons uh, sometimes if we have one year and we have one winter season in, in January, February and another winter season in December. But if you have two years, you have three winter seasons. That was the question if you have more winter seasons because one season is combined across the year boundary. You get a threshold for each season, which was defined beforehand, and you can see when the season is hard. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, but if the pictures appear, um, I, I have to maybe update the repository because they are, I think, not linked to the GitHub. But I also prepared PDF where the picture should be appear, where the pictures should appear. And there's a question from Vincente Ondunga with a C70, 210, and 320. These are days of the year. So it starts at one and ends at 365 or 66, depending on the year. Okay. We will uh, cover this the season thing again in the hands on exercise. So I will move on to get them. So now, when we filter for these uh, low use star threshold values and low use star values, we have a lot of gaps in our data. And when we want to have annual estimates or monthly estimates or whatever, and that is good to fill those gaps because if we have many gaps during nighttime, and if we don't fill those gaps and only use the daytime records, we of course will overestimate the magnitude of the flux. So we replace those missing values by model values. How do we do this? There are um, Two methods that are implemented in RID prop, which are later on combined. And the one is also lookup tables. And they assume that fluxes are similar if they have similar environmental conditions and are close in time. So if you have the same temperature, the same water vapor in the air, and the same radiation in, during two or three days, you can assume that your Ecosystem will have a similar flux. 
And if you increase the window, when you look for those similar conditions, you will include more and more observations. Of course, then you also get some bias across time because your conditions can change. And now, if you have uh, a lot of those values um, in similar conditions, you can compute the mean. And this then becomes the estimate for your missing record. And you get another um, estimate, which is the standard deviation across all those values in similar conditions, which is an estimate of the uncertainty. And it also changes, of course, with wind directions and so on. So you get a little bit of uncertainty that includes all the different systems. And this variation, we call it an underscore, an underscore F for fill and SD for standard deviation. It's kind of a random error that you get by you know, changing winds and so on, which is only across time. If you don't have these covariates like um, radiation temperature, there's a simple approach. If you say, okay, in the same hour across several days, my fluxes will also be similar. So if I'm not too many days away from my, from my record that's missing, I can replace it with the average um, of the fluxes at the same hour around the previous next day. And maybe I also include the Previous next hour, which could be size record for our own data. And then these are combined in the called marginal distribution sampling. First, it tries to do the lookup table. And if it doesn't have enough records, so for example, if the air temperature is missing or so on, it tries the mean diurnal force. And it cycles around this with an increasing window of uh, time so it looks for in, in just the next and previous day and then it spends the three days five days to several days and in order to get a handle on which quality of gap filling was used so of course it's better to have a lookup table in short time window and using the mean line force in the larger time window there is a quality flag and that increases and if I have fewer variables in larger time window. Zero means I have original observations, they are not filled. One means they are depth filled with good quality, and bigger than one means depth filled with lower quality. And there are several steps here. And you can look into the details, it's described in the web or at the paper. And maybe you try a little bit to which quality level you can you can look with your analysis of the data. And it's, of course, depends a lot on which purpose we use the data for. So with any block, you have your class, you say dollar, and then you say which kind of the star threshold you want to use, like any new star threshold, and you say MDS get for new star sense and the variable you want to fill, which is usually your NE. This takes a while, and you get a screen output and says for which you star value you are gap filling. And then um, you see also how much of the data is marked as a gap. You see already uh, in the results, which you get by edit from export results, if you look for the column names and grab all the columns that. That if you can start with an E and have an F like the fill, you see there are different columns produced, one for the original U star and the other ones for the different compounds. And of course, all the uncertainty. And there's also a fingerprint plot available. Um, so on the x-axis, we have the time of the day. So in the midnight, in the morning, and in the evening, and here we have the time of the year, starting in January to December. And usually we have the, the most negative fluxes during noon to the most uptake of um, carbon dioxide in summer. Yeah. 
this is a nice way to compare different sites or different materials of the same site because it's a visual impression of the entire flux of the entire year. So that was for gasoline. Now I look at the chat again if there are questions. And I see no further questions. So I go to flux partitioning. Now that we have at least filled fluxes or model fluxes for each time that we have for each half hour, we can partition this flux into the cross fluxes. So the net ecosystem exchange is the flux measured by the sensor that goes from the ecosystem to the atmosphere. So at night, it corresponds to respiration. But a day it corresponds to the difference between restoration and the cross primary production, so the uptake by the ecosystem. And there are two basic methods implemented in RDProc. One is the so called nighttime partitioning, and it estimates the ecosystem restoration by its relationship with temperature. And uh, respiration, um, you can be sure. So uh, corresponds to the NEE if we are at night, because we have no light at night, <laughs> then uh, GPT should be zero. And so we can fit those um, respiration temperature relationship and apply it then as a draw the thing. In the daytime partitioning, it fits a model of the NEE to global radiation GPT and temperature at daytime, and by um, having that the um, GPP changes with radiation and ecosystem respiration changes more with temperature, you can somehow discriminate between these two classes in a fluid model. So, first we have to sort all the records between daytime and nighttime. And this is, we usually compute a um, threshold of incoming solar radiation. And after uh, dusk and dawn. Before dusk and dawn, um, there is a threshold of 10 watts per square meter where we can say, okay, um, there is no more too much light. And we can assume nighttime. And additional, we compute the sunrise and sunset from the time zone and the geolocation. And this is additional constraints. So both have to be true to be classified as nighttime. So the model that is fitted to the restoration, which is a called Lloyd and Taylor model, and there is a, a reference temperature, and then um, ecosystem respiration increases with some temperature exponentially, and there is a temperature sensitivity is zero that um, is a parameter that describes how strongly the exponential increase with temperature is there. So with the Lloyd and Taylor model, we have the P0, which should be lower than any measured temperature or any relevant measured temperature at minus 36, and the reference temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And this temperature sensitivity is zero is fitted in successive 15 K periods. And to make it more robust, it's actually refitted after some outliers. The extreme values in, in respiration and temperatures are removed, or respiration are removed. And then you have um, a zero for each 15 days, and you have an annually aggregated temperature sensitivity. And by taking the mean across the three best values, and the three best values are determined by conditions that there are enough records, it has a lot of temperature range. And also that the estimated temperature sensitivity is reasonable. If any of these conditions are violated, like you have a, a temperature range of only one degree of Celsius, you of course can fit the temperature sensitivity, but it's, it's not very robust because we don't have all the temperature range. If we have this, um, all these parameters in the model of this temperature relationship. And we can use 
this model to predict ecosystem restoration. And we do this in, in seven days windows shifted for four days to predict the restoration. And the relationship changes because the reference temperature is changing uh, over the year. So, I will look at the questions later. So there is a change uh, in the temperature restoration relationship is changing over the year. And we can use this model to predict ecosystem restoration. And at the end, we obtain the first primary by the difference between the NE and R equal. So theoretically, um, R equal and GPT should add up to NE uh, without any error because it's just a difference. Here. And because R equal is modeled and it can be bigger than the actual R equal, we subtract too much so we can have negative GPT. In the daytime flux partitioning, the model is a little bit more complicated. It's daytime restoration. And, um, GPP is fitted. So here is a radio um, incoming solar radiation. And here is the GPP that is modeled. Well, GPP minus restoration that is modeled. And several parameters. And, yeah, we'll not go into the details. And this is the equation, and you can um, read it as a Peter Lassmott's paper from 2010. And it models our eco based on the nighttime um, temperature sensitivity, increasing the temperature. And there is also a GPP effect that decreases like the saturation GPP attributed to goes down. And there's several parameters to estimate. But overall, it's a model fitting exercise to radiation and income solar radiation and temperature. We still need the uh, nighttime because this temperature sensitivity is zero is still estimated at the nighttime ecosystem restoration. The details of estimating this state differ slightly between the nighttime and daytime um, methods, partitioning methods. In the daytime methods, E0 can also change over the year. And now, these alpha and beta and also the R red, they are not estimated in nighttime data, but actually as a daytime data using this light response for parameter. Yeah. So when we predicting fluxes across time, we use shifting time windows and also the estimates of the parameters, they change over time. And because we don't want to do this for each half hour, we do this um, for several time windows and interpolate in between. There is a, another method which we implemented, uh, which is for Keenan, for Trevor Keenan in 2019, he proposed that we should um, actually use the nighttime fit to predict restoration in nighttime and the daytime fit for predicting restoration uh, during daytime, because during daytime, restoration might be suppressed. So the temperature uh, ecosystem relationship might differ between daytime and nighttime. And this is especially consequences I saw in, in sites which are quite quite hot, the tropical sites. I don't know. But um, there are still issues here because we have large jumps just across dust and dawn. And there is not really good evaluation across sites, which is provided for for comparison if you want to also have another method to predict the competition in the classes. And a word of caution, all those methods, um, they, they rely on that you have 
good relationship between your ecosystem respiration and temperature. If your moisture is really influencing respiration, or um, if you then have very cold conditions below freezing, where your respiration will not really increase from minus five to minus degrees centigrade, or also in tropic conditions where it's, it's warm all the time and other factors um, actually influence the ecosystem respiration, this just do not work. So if you use our Eddyproc to partitioning those fluxes, and sometimes our Eddyproc complains and say, okay, I can't really get a good temperature respiration relationship. And we may try to tune parameters and, and get a thing, but there are sites where this partition just doesn't work because of other factors. So how do you do this R ID plot? So first, um, because it computes sunrise and sunset, you have to tell any clock where the site is located. And then you usually fill also the, the variates that you use, like the air temperature, GPP, and the incoming solar radiation, because these are needed in this in daytime flux partition. And then you just say a clock to Marcus Reichstein, it's nighttime flux partitioning across all the different star scenarios. And then you will have new output column in the result, which are equal and GPT to all the different um, new star threshold scenarios. And you have an additional column, the GPT FQC, which uh, is bigger than one, denotes bad quality windows where the Fit to the slight response curve was there, but very uncertain. Not really much. And also, where, um, where a valid fit could be obtained is further away from the time where I used the model to compute the uh, GPT So it might happen that um, you get a fit on, say, January 22nd, but no fits on the following. Four days, and on the fifth day, you get again a good fit. So, two days away, I think, I don't know in which thresholds it would give a bad quality, but sometimes you are further away from actually the conditions we estimate normally. Of course, you can also compute the fingerprint plot here. So, the GPT looks quite similar to the NEE. Change fine, and the eco is more like it changes throughout the years and not this much throughout the day. The daytime partitioning is um, involved with GL for Gita Lasma because it was her paper where she introduced this method. And similar, there is a TK travel feeding approach. And for the Daytime partitioning, you also get an uncertainty estimates. So there is an error propagation. Um, how much the, the estimated GPT varies with the uncertainty of the ground. And at the end, because we are now done with the last step of the edit and the partitioning, you can say. My edit prop class, please give me the result in the our data frame, so you can write them to the file. Okay, now I look at the questions again. Now they are quite a few. Uh, I think uh, I think Andrew asked a question about uh, about uh, aside from annual sums, what is the the best way to deal with the uh, with negative GPT value for the subsequent uh, analysis modeling driver determination functioning functional relationship? If you go up uh, to the to the last uh, fifth message, you can see. From Andrew Hill about his question. Mm -hmm. 
I have problems to understand you, uh, Sam. Sorry. Yes. So if you go up uh, to the, if you go to the, go to the chat, and uh, you go to the, the last uh, fifth message, you can see from Andrew, and he has a question. Okay, I scroll down. Yeah. So data generally won't give negative values of GPP, I guess. No. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, he has that question. I have to think because we have some uncertainty in the parameters, and the parameters they are um, estimated um, on, on the entire curve. So usually the the light response curve should um, balance your ecosystem restoration and GPP to get an and the really an easy one. GPP theoretically is always above zero, but because the parameters have some uncertainty, there are cases where the GPP can be slightly below zero. What are the questions of negative GPP? And another thing that um, in the data and partitioning method, also the GPP and our eco are both model parameters. So they don't necessarily add up to the original NE they were that were used to partition the classes. And also, and also another uh, the question is that uh, our uh, that uh, that ecosystem some restoration at the at the TAR are not correlated or they are correlated from uh uh other uh this question. Uh it's go if you go up uh, uh a little bit you can see that question from I understood the question okay. correctly is if we estimated GPP and our equal are correlated in time, and that's clearly the case because um you estimate oh. um, the model parameters. And then you use the same model and the same parameters to predict um, the values across time. Okay. Um, there, there your predictions kind of um, have an uncertainty that's not completely independent, but you use the, the same model and the same parameters to predict for, for some times or interpolate. Okay, cool. And also from Ravenna, they asked a question about uh, both the method uh, I'll give the same annual GPT at the RE value, and uh, they may have a uh, have negative GPT value at for some size. Not sure why. Um, so so I, I see you. With Questions from Andrew Hill, and I think that relates to because if, sorry, I have difficulties for understanding. And um, he asked, and um, how you should deal with negative GPT values in subsequent analysis. And this really depends on um, what you want to do with your with your analysis. If you want to average something, then it's usually um, not good to exclude these negative values or and set them to zero. But if the model that breaks down, if you provide GPT fluxes that are smaller than zero, you have to kind of be creative. <laughs> so that if you can, and if it doesn't cause problems with your analysis, please leave those GPT values that are smaller than zeros in the analysis, because otherwise you get a bias to higher GPT. Because if your flux is near zero, some will be below zero, some will be higher zero. So if you um, throw away the ones below zero or set them to zero, you will get a flux which is biased toward the higher value. Um, so then I have a question. Are eco and TR are not correlated? From Vincent Longo. Um, uh, 
Well, we hope that, our, that those fluxes are really correlated. <laughs> if they are not correlated, we, we have lost. Yeah, we don't, can, cannot do the partitioning. And of course, so our echo is computed based on the air and some parameters. So they are really very, very closely correlated, actually. There's another question at 540 from Vincent Obongo. If there's uncertainty in some ecosystems between our eco and my time to air. Um, if there is uncertainty, uh, you also have uncertainty in the estimated parameters, like in the temperature sensitivity and on the reference temperature. And the uncertainty of those parameters is propagated to uncertainty in GPP and uncertainty in our eco in the daytime and um, flux partition approach. Um, during nighttime approach, we didn't implement such kind of um, propagation of the error. So we don't have an estimate of the uncertainty of those classes. Uh, Thomas, there's uh, another the question from Bruna Wind. Uh, can you answer that question? It's at the end of the chat. Okay, so I read it loud. Still about the partitioning. Maybe I did not understand my time partitioning. Use the air as a factor to split the data and calculate respiration. If yes, it is expected that the air and air present high relationship if those are inserted in a statistical model. Is that correct? So uh, the air is not uh, used as a factor, but as a predictor. So we have this model where respiration increases with um, temperature exponentially. So, okay, if it's, and here comes in another questions. I guess nighttime value of GPP are due to underestimation of ecosystem respiration for the time, maybe due to other factors. In nighttime those of GPP. So um, actually at nighttime we set GPP to zero, I guess. We don't um, use the model to be clear. In nighttime partitioning, they are zero because um, ecosystem restoration and we are the same. And in daytime partitioning for the nighttime, I have to look up what we actually do, but I think we set them to zero. Thomas, that is correct. The daytime partitioning method, the nighttime GPP is consequently zero. Yeah. And then another question is, can I manually change, modify the scale colors in the fingerprint so that I could have the same color scale of different years? And yes, it was a request that we implemented at some time, but I cannot tell out of the head how to do this. So the, the color scale actually is produced only, the color scale is produced only when you print the PDF or have a, a, the same function. So we would have to um, look up the actual documentation of this fingerprint plot function, but it's possible to change the color scale and the white face for scale. And here is um, another correction of the questions. So the negative values of GPP by nighttime method is due to underestimation of um, ecosystem restoration. That's correct, yes. Okay, 
So I go on to the next small topic, um, which is uncertainty estimation. And I will cover only here the uncertainty estimation due to use star threshold. And in the PDF, you find even more. Also, yeah. So we saw already that when we use different use star thresholds, we introduce a bias in our NEE estimate. So the lower our use star threshold, usually the lower is also NEE predicted in the gap -tend. When we now compute the uncertainty estimates for the annual uh, aggregate, um, we can just take the uncertainty across all our different scenarios. So here in this um, our markdown file, I have only four scenarios, original and three quantiles. Usually you would have more. But here we just get these four different suffixes, so that all the scenarios that we process and store them in the variable use bottom. Then we can um, have a function that takes the suffix and does some computation. Like in this function I created here, I paste our echo underscore suffix. And then I do the mean across all the results of this column. So that would be the mean, if we have one year of data, that would be the annual aggregate of our restoration. And then I have a method where I can ask the Ediprop class, please apply this method to all my different restart scenarios. And then this of mean then would be applied to our echo v star, our echo v 0, 05, our echo v 50, and so on. And then I get a list, or on this, I get a vector where I can say um, uh, different estimates of this annual star threshold, and with these different estimates, I can do the median or I can extend the deviation. For the relative error. Here I use the median because with only four estimates and mean, the also standard estimation would be very, very rough. <laughs> so in this example, um, this should be reprocessing, is actually about 1.9% um, because I multiplied by 100 of relative errors introduced by this unknown new source threshold estimate. So if you want to have a more robust analysis, um, you should increase the sample number for the original bootstrap. And you also um, provide more probabilities to be the processing work. So here at the length out is 30, so I provide um, actually 30 different these star thresholds one time. And then you have also 30 values to average over that you base your uncertainty estimates on. But remember, um, for each of those these star scenarios, you have to do the entire processing chain, gap filling and uh, partitioning. So it is really it does not um, scale or it scales badly. Now. And I skipped the random uncertainty here. So it would be kind of another talk. <laughs> and we will have this a little bit in the, in the hands on session. It's just that you want to get this across. You compute your entire processing chain with different these star thresholds. And then you can um, use these different estimates of the aggregation. To the end or whatever you do with a uh, user provided function um, to get uncertainty of your aggregated value. Um, I have one thing that I want to get across here it is <laughs> if I have the possibility to speak to many people, because it's one of the most used, uh, most asked questions um, for people using the RAD prop and also our online tool. And it has to do with the end of period time span convention in the flux map. So end of period time span convention means 
that for half hours, if the hour runs from midnight to um, half past midnight, then time, time spent gets associated with half past midnight. So it's the end of the period um, that um, our record is referring to. And this needs some care when you prepare your input data. And it's described in FAQ. And I just um, open this here. So you see here, um, it's the address for the NPC, which is Vienna, and there's an FAQ site. What do I get? Why do I get these different timestamps and the input format? But yeah, I um, explain it in the slides. So here it says it's not at the end of the first half hour instead of 2.30. And at the last timestamp, it's also not at midnight. So our edit box um, gives you a warning if your first record is not the first half hour of the day. So one of the requirements of your input data is that you get full days. So you need to start with a record that ends at 30, half past 12, because the first record runs from midnight to half past midnight. So how does this happen? If we load an um, editor library and then some famous dplyr library to fly around with our data, we see that the example data 2004 in the TBZ example, and it ends at 0 0.3, um, sorry, half past midnight. So this is the correct thing that your data should be prepared in. But now what happens if I subset the data? So the pragmatic approach is I extract the year here out of my daytime column and I compare it if it's 2005. And because um, the POSIX daytime year delivers the year after 1900, I have to subtract this year. And then um, this actually filters for all the timestamps in 2005. But what we actually get is the first time since is in 2005, January 1st, midnight. And for R, this is 2005. But in any proc end of timestamp convention, this is the last time step in the year 2004 because it ends at New Year's Eve. And this kind of produces several con con confusion in the community, but also with RLE proc, because RLE proc uses matrix operation to align the data and extract different days and so on. And sometimes you process all of your data by year. Example, we use four threshold estimate. And here you provide data with a single record for 2004, where any plot really gets in the problem. So the right way to, to do this filtering, and here, for example, is um, you do not use the end of timestamp convention, but you subtract 15 minutes. So you have daytime minus. 15 times 60. So this, these are seconds. These are the 15 times 60 seconds, which is 15 minutes. And then I convert this timestamp, 15 minutes subtracted, and I, I get a year. And then the first record in this year is really 2005, January 1st, half past midnight. And this is also described in the FAQ. Mm -hmm. So with this, it's the end of my things that I want to have told you with the, with the processing. And we can go on with the, with the FAQ. Mm -hmm. So now I look at the, at the chat again, and I see Matthias is asking, why is RAD proc using sample timestamps? It actually does. So when um, it imports your data into the class, it actually produces its own column as date time, which has the sample timestamp, and internally only uses this uh, sample timestamp. 
if could um, say, okay, or any drug could digest data which has um, a different timestamp convention. But I think this would create even more confusion in the community across different tools and the different data preparations if you do not stick in, in, in to, to the usual fraction convention. Yeah, Tarek is, is just writing, so it's the S date time um, column that is produced during your initial data import that has the sample time. Stamp. Feel free to also repeat your questions that I did not spot in the chat in the chat above. <laughs> so we can also go back to different slides. Thomas, so now I think we can have a uh, uh, we can have a, a five minute break, so we can we can move on that. Uh, that had a training session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so we can have a five, five minutes break. Yeah, just um, if you have not done it yet, then um, please start up your R studio and please um, download this. Um, if, if you want to follow the hands on exercise, there is this link in the EGU 1980 course. With the hands on session, and there is a file, the ABC example RMD, which we will work on. You will need to load this into your R Studio. So I stop sharing my screen. I can. Okay, so we will open open this file in our, our studio, right? Okay. We will, we will download the, this uh, uh, RMD file and then open it in our studio. Yeah. Okay. See you in five minutes.
Uh, Thomas, now I guess so we are ready to go. Okay, welcome back to our Eddie Brock course. So I have now shared my our studio window here with a big font. So I hope you can follow along. So this is one of those RMD files where we can mix markdown text and some of the R things. And the R things are included in such um, three backticks R thing. And we can execute them by clicking on this little triangle here. So we will go through all the, all the steps that we covered in, in the previous talks now by one example. So this example is um, the crop field. Um, in Terinia. Um, so it's, it has been managed uh, for some time by our institute. So I know it a little bit and we have some, yeah, some experience with it. Actually, it's a new Flux Data EU um, data repository, which has its own color names and stuff like this. But uh, we have pre processed it by a function F low dual Flux 16, uh, where it takes care of all the different conventions of reporting the data. So first we load our library, and then we, um, if we load the library, the DEGIT example variable data set is already available. And we have to say data, DEGIT something to make it available. And then we can <coughs> plot the summary here. And do it again, maybe it's also. So you see the variables have the date time. This is already in our POSIX city format. Um, and it starts at, at the right hour already. We have MEE from minus 49 to 20 frames to 22 more, more, more units. You store friction velocity, air temperature, relative humidity, and incoming solar radiation. So we don't have VPD here, but we have relative humidity. Fortunately, uh, our edit truck has a function that calls VPD from, the, uh, from RH into R. So we give it RH into R. Um, the documentation says about the units. And then we also have stored in the column VPD of our VPD example. The VPD example is just a data, data frame. So the first task that you are faced with is you should initialize uh, edit block class using function uh, initialize uh, using function new in the hook, and you get to by um, as edit block initialize. The site is located at 51 degrees north and 10 degrees east. And the time zone here is Berlin time. Which is one hour ahead of the general new time. I also follow along. I can um, mark this and then my control enter and execute it in, the, in our common prompt and here in the side. I get um, some documentation. And a lot of things that you can do. Um, from from the developers, they also have some types in the variable names that have been duplicated but can still be used to expect what can happen. So we call Just have a look at the chat. The link to the GitHub folder is there. It must be the final new mark from the computer. The new mark from the computer. Okay. 
the most two important things that we have to provide to the initialized module here is the ID, which is just, just a string, and the data frame, which we already loaded. And it's the, the example. For the other things, we can review the details. So um, with, with the live session, so we did this already at ETU 2019, and we could look at the, at the screens and see if people were ready. So here it's a little bit more difficult in this online setting. It would be nice if, uh, I suggest I just go on and you write in the chat if I'm too fast. Or, yeah. Just to explain again here, and um, this is the peculiarity of this object oriented reference class system. We have to use the new method, and it actually calls this method initialize, which is documented under the thing that we just provide the name in the data set. And here we use our newly created any prop class to invoke its method set location info. And provided with um, an yeah, argument that you can get you in the head. Thomas, uh, can you share your, your code in the chat? Can you share your co code in the chat so we can, we can copy it? So in the chat, I only see um, how you create a new file? Uh, no. No, I mean, can you copy your code to the chat so we can copy your okay. code to repeat that? Yeah, thank you. So now our site is such a crop site where we actually have information on the changing roughness conditions. So when we harvest the site several times a year, the micrometeorological conditions, they will change for the cropping periods. So the next um, task is to, to get a rough idea of all these different seasons and to see this data. This will be Thomas, in the box. Thomas? Yeah? There is a question in the chat with uh, regard to the prefix of the S that comes in front. Maybe you can explain some additional words on the um, mm -hmm. on the architecture plus the naming conventions of functions and the classes. Yeah. So um, the, the R and prop R package provides the usual R functions. And a usual R function is like the converting timestamps or summary or also this called VPT from R and TR, which are independent of the edit block class. These are usual functions and they are usually stored with the F of functions. And the kind of special functions that have access to this edit block class, they are invoked in eProp dollar. And then there is usually there is an S. This is just a naming convention that um, the initial developer of any block until Moffat um, adopted, and I I stick to it. So usually all the things that um, start with S are methods of any block class, and other things, and especially the ones that start with, with F, 
um, are usually functional. But it, it has no, no effect in R. It, it, it could call it also um, T set location info, or only set location info. It's just a naming convention that it's marked with this is usually a, a, a thing that relates to the edit box. Now. It's well, only that you want um, maybe, maybe help maybe some Thomas. function and have to have this prepend by s edit block and the score in order to get the help. You can also try to, to, to call this without the e edit prop, and then you will get an error like this. Could not find function in info. Okay, then we are clever. We pretending the thing because then it should exist. And then uh, It was a feedback here. Um, you get an um, uh, error message that is not really convenient. It will not change the value of the locket binding S location. The S location is actually a field inside the edit block class. And if you call this thing outside the edit block class, you get such um, awkward um, failures or error messages. So, Instead of doing this, like um, it's in the in the in the in the help actually, because it's the the function name that's called, and we do this. And that's all naming convention. So here we plotted this. So we have several years, 2004 and 2006, and we see in north summer, the NEE really goes down. So there is uptake. And in winter, in the zero, there is some uptake, but not as much. And now we want to have maybe a season for this period here in the winter, and then a period where we really have the large uptake. Because we know when we have the large uptake, there is this um, grain standing and also affecting by their roughness the wind profile. We actually have more information. We know when the harvest were. And now you can um, define different seasons with day 70, 210, and 204, 71, and, and so on. It's written here. And you have to um, do this in a data frame. This is again uh, the season factor year year day. It doesn't start with a single S, so it's a usual function, not related to the RID prop class.
I haven't done this for a long time, so I also need to look at the documentation. Um, we have to provide an actual vector of date times. And this I took from the original data set. We could also ask the R editor class for the result in the date line, but we can use the more original data set. And then we have to provide a data frame starts where we specify the date of the year and the year in two different colors. So we have a data frame and then provide come year day in the scene. This the R thing for creating vector. And this vector has um, eight entries and the year also needs to have eight entries. So if I execute this, document pen is empty. And it's come up too much. Uh, uh, I guess we miss uh, miss one day in in two thousand six. We miss one day number in the two thousand six for the Y day. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's nice to see how the so this is the data frame that we created. Year day and year, and each row will correspond to one season where you store special value. So now we have this year executed. So now that we have this vector, we can provide it to the star special distribution thing in the plot. So now we say epoch and dollar because we have this f. Mm, sorry, I'll paste this to the chat. If I'm too fast, don't. I wait a little bit. Okay, now the next task is to do actually the star special distribution estimation. And we want to not use the standard seasons, so November to February and so on, but we want to use our seasons as we specify here. This is a method of the EDIPOC class. So we have to estimate the star scenarios. And I again here can help and see what it is. A lot of things that we already hinted and what we should change to the end sample. It's a bit lower so that we don't lose too much time.
We only use the zero one thing. Ninety percent quantile, and then we have to tell it um, that we want to use the scene vector. And here we see season factor is the something. And often it actually is season factor. We can also, oh, okay, <laughs> not well described in the whole. So the scene variable I created above here. I provided to the complement season factor. So I try if I have put it correctly. And this takes a bit of time. Not computing and off any prop class and what it has been done. So usually in this object oriented programming, there is a convention that you either tell the class to do something or you ask the class to get some information. So I tell the class some information, and this is often separated. So now my computation finished. And it's at these 30 bootstraps, as many classes, and so on. This is only for understanding the result a bit more deeply. But now the edit block class has done this, and you can ask now the edit block class to tell me about the special distribution. Then if you store it in some variable, I can ask the edit block class anytime to give me this one. And have a look at, at my output. Here we have a um, different aggregation mode season. So here we have four, two and five, and there will be more rows here. And we have day one, day 17, day 210. These are just identifiers. And for each of those seasons that starts at this day, and we have different response threshold estimates. I'll paste it again in the chat. So season is the period in the year where a consistent response threshold is used. We can vary the response threshold throughout the year, but only in different periods. And the season, um, I have to find here in this line above, where we created the season vector. It's actually a vector of the same length with my date time. Um, I say summary season, and it has um, those values, and you see the number of records that it has those values. So it tells 2004001, 2004001, 2004001 for 3311 records. Then it tells 2004017 for this many records. So actually, for each record in our example, Let's see. The row number it reports um, which season it's in. And the season is just the identifier, and one new star special will be used in each of those 
chunks in the data, which of the period in time. The naming is actually not important. It's just that it has to have equal values to have the equal response threshold. So if you're really nifty and you have a double maximum in, um, like in, in the tropics where you have two vegetation periods that are quite similar, you can often use the same identifier for two periods when the, the sun is in the right above you in a different one. Otherwise, the season is just a period of time or a chunk of records where you use the same new source threshold. So how did you choose the end sample and the plot? Um, of course, um, more samples are good because you get a better estimate of the quantiles of the source threshold distribution. And more quantiles are good because you have more values to average over to get your uncertainty or your median or whatever at the end. But just for this example, we need to limit some runtime. Um, so I choose a very few, a very low value of sample and also a very low value of runtime. And if you have just 30 samples, the uh, 5% and 97, 5% or so quantiles are quite uncertain. But the 10%, 90% are more robust. If you do a real exercise, you should choose higher sample numbers and also more quantiles. And the quantiles you usually choose equally distributed across the distribution. So 5, 10, 15, 20, or 10, 20, 30. Season can be used for a calendar of growing crops, for example. Yeah, seasons are used if you know the periods when you want to use a different two star threshold. And this is if you know the periods when you have a different surface button. So when your surface and how it affects the wind changes, like how it. And the default is um, for periods across the year, which roughly captures the growing in the month and season. And seasons in the okay, Nicholas, thanks for joining. So I go on with task 1c estimated distribution of these fast thresholds. Now that we have done. So now we can move on to gap filling. So these are just simple tasks. Display the default and you will use false threshold distribution because we didn't um, tell our edit prop to use the seasonal use false threshold. We can say epoch get the start scenario. And we will still do the default one. So we have we all our user defined season, but your star value will be the same value for 2004, the same value for 2005, and the same value for all the different years. Now we can tell that the default class, instead of the annual thresholds, use the seasonal threshold. And this is um, method you see the threshold and um, you can ask the report again what threshold you do is your use during get time and then you see it uses the single threshold which differ across the year and here for example in 2004 they in the first two seasons it's like growing up it's um, about 2.12 and uh, 0.12, but then after the 210, it actually changes quite a lot to 0.8. So I paste this to the chat. So the repeat 
even if you specify different symbols, or if you talk by default, this is the annual of thresholds. And these are here. So aggregated the different seasons to one value across the year. But we actually want to use the seasonal values because we know that um, yeah, the roughness is changing at these points in time. And this is done by telling this on every prop with this method. And when you then ask any prop which scenarios we use, it gives a different result. It's the easy way. Okay. So now task to B is perform gap filling for any E. This is again something we have to ask the prop class for. And because we have told our any prop which we store scenarios to use before, we don't need to put this in here again. And then, uh, bring up the help again. So this help actually refers to other arguments in the escape for the first variables are usually the most important. And the first one, which has no default here, is flux var. The flux variable to get to after you start with it. And we are asked then to fill in. E. We could also fill temperature or stuff, other, other things, but we, we want to fill in. E. And the other things we, we leave to default. Actually, um, we do one more. Mm. And we tell our any prop that it not only fills the missing values, but we want to have a model estimate also for the other values. And This is done by variable in all. I admit you have to know these things and look it up into the, into the walkthroughs so because there are so many options in, in our EDPOC that you only use. Very few of the times, but it's better to follow along the, the guides instead of reading all through the different the documentation here. But if you have something in a guide, you can look it up what it actually means because it's explained here. So all, so all the values to estimate uncertainty. It's not only the missing values, but also the other values will have the model value in the Okay. And also uncertainty. That's the thing you want to know. Hi Thomas, just to remind you to be a little behind schedule. No worries. Yeah. Now I, I don't want to go through all the um, exercise with you. So there, there is some also um some uncertainty estimation and so on, but I didn't plan to finish this year. I just wanted to give you a feeling of any talk. And we can also follow along here and, and I can also give you the, the, the solution to the exercise. <laughs> I think we do just 10 more minutes and, and then I post the, the link to the solution. Is this okay? Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, great. Yeah. I, I think we have about uh, about 10 minutes left, and it was a very rewarding, enjoyable for learning process. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I feel I learned uh, a lot about uh, how to use this uh, package. So now maybe we can have a very brief Q&A session. So if mm -hmm. you have uh, some questions, you can post in the chat, or maybe maybe you can also ask uh, on mute and. Uh, 
us. And uh, yeah, so we have about uh, about 10 minutes left. Okay, so let's uh, have an answer and question. Yeah, sure. And uh, and the one thing is about uh, about how how can we find a solution answers for this uh, for the tasks in this uh, document? How where can we find the answer for those? Uh, yes, I put, just copying the URL. So it's in the edit course and repository. Okay. Yeah, you have that post uh, to the every to the audience. Okay, so this is the the link to the solutions and answers for all those tasks. Mm -hmm. You can find the uh, answers. Um, okay. Any question you can post in the chat. I, I think we have a, a question previously posted in the chat and uh, they asked the, how did you choose the the own sample at the, the prob, probability levels? For the response thresholds? Yeah, so how did you choose the n sample number of sample at uh, the probability level, like uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.9? Yeah, I recommend to use um, for kind of robust estimate to at least use 30 values. Because if you want to compute a mean or a standard deviation, and um, this is kind of a, of a required thing. So if you have only 10 or so, you save processing time, and then your uncertainty estimate itself will be uncertain. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thomas, there's a, there's a well question from Mary and a well question from Lisa, you can in the chat. Yeah, so we have, um, I have a general question. Is there a minimum number of data points needed for the NEU partitioning or any plot in general? Um, the different um, things that you do with R, you plot your gap filling, your star estimation, data and partitioning, and so on, they all have different um, requirements. So usually you should have at least three or four months of data without too long gaps in order to use this um, R80 plot. If you have shorter, shorter data, there are always um, options to tweak R80 plot to, to, to skip those kind of sensibility or reasonability um, checks that you have enough data. But in order to, um, to do kind of robust work, or any block has some checks, and they are, if you are have less data than those checks, you can try to tweak, but um, yeah, be cautious. And yeah, I have a very new site with less than a year of data available. What's the recommended minimum length of PC data collection typically? So yeah, so I say about three to four months is, is already okay. Of course, not for an annual estimate, but for you know, all the things you can do. It depends a bit on how much data gets you have, and how much data you filter with your your star special. So here, yeah, I just post another link um, to our online web service. So this is actually a quite um, nice thing. So, uh, I unshare my screen and try to browse again. Mm -hmm. 
it is it's an online tool that is based on the RID proc package. And you don't have too much flexibility here. So there is a, is a form where you can just, oops, um, upload your data. It's here in processing. And then you have your, put in your site ID and, and you browse for, for a file, like the text file that you want to process. And then you'd say if you have once you have new star filtering, then the different methods that you want to apply. If you need any the moving point test that is implemented that you can use here, you can and use this new star specified uh, seasonal new star columns, then you must need provide a column season already in the perspective. But the default is the continuous may have um, November to February in one season. And you can have a good start uncertainty. So yes, it takes a bit longer, but then you have these different these false questions. I think we have only three quantiles there. It's because it all runs in all terms. So the flux partitioning, we have um, rush time, nighttime, or daytime partitioning. We have to fill in the site locations and to say the name of the variable that holds the temperature. Please provide your email so that when the results are ready, they run in our country cluster, you get an email that you can, can download them. So if you are not familiar with R and still want to use this package and you are fine with the default, then this is quite a nice thing. And you also find a lot of information here, like the data formats or also the FAQ. Maybe I can add one uh, from from a user perspective, one comment with respect to the data length and availability in the data. So if if you have a data set that is actually growing, so you just started a site, for example, be aware that depending on the use star threshold estimates, your values of NEE will actually change quite a bit and with respect to that also your GPP and IECO estimates. So if you have a new season after three months, you have only one season available that you are using, then maybe you have a second season with a, with a much higher or lower U star threshold in that season and that will then have an impact on the overall seasonal U star threshold and once you have a total year together, then you will actually be able to get your final U star threshold estimate for that year, which then again is changing a little bit due to the bootstrapping of the U star threshold estimation. So keep this in mind when you are like continuously looking at data and you realize at some point, oh, something changed. Wasn't this different two months ago? And that would be the reason why you have these changes. Yeah. And repurpose if you have more data available. So if you have more data or any pockets, better also for the period that you analyzed before. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now I think uh, we are we we are we are on time. And thank you everyone for your for your attendance, and uh, we are really appreciate the. Uh, uh, for our our speak, it was a very wonderful learning uh, learning process, and uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Goodbye. See you. Pleasure. Next time. <clears throat> Goodbye, okay. everyone. Uh, Landy, I have a question. Yeah, you can uh, find answer in that. Uh, Solution part. Uh, I can post uh, that link again. So for Lindy, you can find uh, the solution for your code in this uh, document. Um, sorry, Shane, uh, I'm sorry for not me, but uh, I have my own data set, and I keep running into this code, uh, this error over and over and over again. So I was just going to check if. 
I could get help with it, or how would I, how to solve this error that I'm getting? So on there, there is this FAQ page. They do a lot of the frequently asked things. And if, if you cannot make sense out of it, or you, you are stuck, and uh -huh. there is this email address here, our editor help at bgzena.mpg. This will be answered by me. <laughs> um, the best way to approach this is that you really upload, if you are fine with the standard processing, that you upload the data really at the web interface. Mm -hmm. And don't send me big, big, big files and so on. And then, mm -hmm. and there is a so called file identifier in the processing form. Yeah, go again to the processing. Huh. And there is assigned job ID. So when you start processing, this job will be have this ID. And if you write me your ID, uh -huh. I have the processing that happened in our servers. And on the logs, and this is the, the best way for me to be back in. Okay, yeah, because I think Thomas, I emailed you a couple of times, and thank yes. you so much for your nice to see your face. Yeah, uh, but I'll email again with the job ID because I'm still stuck and I cannot find a way to fix it. Welcome. Um, is that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, I add, uh, add anyone else have some specific question to ask? If not, uh, I we we will end this meeting. Okay, I guess we don't have any more questions. We we will end this meeting. Tom, um, thank, thank you very much again for your presentation. It was a very very wonderful.